let's consider the idea of population genetics. Okay, so up until now, we've been talking about genes and individuals and how it can affect them. Well, let's talk about how genes fluctuate in a population and what that means. So population genetics is changes in genetic variation within a group of individuals over time. Okay. Why do population geneticists study this? Because they want to know the extent of that genetic variation, why it exists in that population, and how it changes over many generations. So what is a population? So a population is then defined as all of the individuals of the same species in the same area at the same time that can breed with one another. Okay. So there's a lot of restrictions on it. And then even within population, there's local populations, okay, where that members that are closer to each other are more likely to breed than somewhere far away. So if we consider the human population, right? We can say that all humans are one population. We can mix with each other and we're all on Earth. But if you were to separate it by states, then you can say, you know, only people in Maryland, and you can even go further to say only people in Baltimore, Maryland, or so, or North Maryland, are likely to breed with each other. But all humans are one population, and then those local populations are people who tend to be closer to each other. When we talk about populations, we're also concerned with the genes within that population, and if they are polymorphism or monomorphism. Now, we've talked about polymorphism before when we talked about mutations, but it doesn't always have to be a mutation. So if you look here, these spiders are all the same species. They can breed with each other but they have different alleles in that population that cause them to look a little different. Same thing with these birds and then these shells on the snail, right? So same organism, but different genes that give them a distinct phenotype. Humans have polymorphism when it comes to the ABO, right? So I guess let's take a step back and what is polymorphism? So if you don't remember, this is talking about traits that tend to have more than two alleles, okay? Traits that are, that has variation in a population roughly at the same degree. The ABO system in humans, we can be A, B, A, B, or O, four as opposed to two that we're used to. Now in contrast to monomorphism, mono meaning one, monomorphic genes usually exist as a single allele, okay? That single allele accounts for 99% of the cases. So this type of bird are all the same on the outside. Okay? They all look the same. So they are monomorphic, whereas if there's variation within a population, they are polymorphic. One gene, three or more. Okay, so it has to be more than two alleles here. Now, how do you get those? So those polymorphisms are usually chromosomal or gene mutations. So chromosomal being deletions over a large area, duplications over a large area of a chromosome, or SNPs, that single change within one gene. Here we're looking at hemoglobin. So here's our normal hemoglobin in humans. We have this A to T. If we end up with a T to A, this is sickle cell, single nucleotide change could be a polymorphism. There's also a loss of function or deletion in the hemoglobin gene. So this is three types that can exist in people, although we know there are many more. Okay, so this is how we get polymorphisms. Now, that single nucleotide polymorphism isn't always associated with disorders and diseases. It's also just normal variation. So within people, we know that there's about a 1% change, and those are SNPs. These are just single nucleotide base pairs that are different from one to another, and as a result, it gives us variation within our population. Another thing that population genetics is concerned with is allele and genotype frequency. So ask yourself, what is a frequency, right? Like, how many times does something show up? So we can talk about this in the sense of alleles and genotypes. Now, that means you have to dig back to Mendelian inheritance and remember what is an allele and what is a genotype. So if we're going to walk through this, if we have a population of 100 frogs, right? And this is the makeup of phenotype and genotypes. So to calculate that allele frequency, we need to know the number of copies of a single allele versus the total number of all alleles, right? 
Keep in mind that homozygous individuals have two copies of that allele, whereas heterozygous would only have one. You can then calculate the allele frequency for the recessive, lowercase g, or the dominant, uppercase g. So the total numbers of copies in an allele. So let's take the 64, for example. So 64 plus 64 plus 32 over 64 plus 64 plus 32 plus 4 plus 4, right? Or 200. And that's how you would get the frequency. Now, if you're looking at alleles, and now you need to know how many people have that, I'm sorry, if you're looking at genotype, how many people have that genotype? You can calculate that for the homozygous dominant, the heterozygous, or the homozygous recessive. Here is a little simpler because it's spelled out. 64 people are homozygous dominant, so 64 over 100 in this case, right? But that's how you calculate allele and genotype frequencies. And when you calculate it, bear in mind that they should always be equal than or le a little less than 1 or 100% because we're talking about all the individuals in a population. If it's monomorphic, it's that one allele which should be equal or very close to 1. So remember, 99%. And then if it's polymorphic, all of those alleles should equal that 1 or 100%. Now, this is important because you can use it for Hardy-Weinberg. And now, Hardy-Weinberg came along and figured out that if you know the allele frequencies, you can calculate those genotype frequencies. And so, we're look, using the letters P and Q, where P is dominant and Q is recessive. Now, all of the alleles P plus all of the alleles Q should equal 1, yes? And then once he did some mathematical equation, it came up to P squared, which would be the homozygous state, plus 2PQ, heterozygous, plus Q squared, homozygous recessive, equals up to 1. This applies to genes that are in diploid individuals with two alleles only. It also assumes that there's no new mutations, okay? Mutations cannot occur. There's no genetic drift. There's no migration of organisms in and out. There's no natural selection. And then there's random mating. So you can't mate based on selection. Those are the requirements for Hardy-Weinberg to be true. And then Hardy-Weinberg gives us this quantitative relationship between alleles and genotype frequency. And so we're able to say, okay, if this is how many alleles you have, this is going to be the genotype you have. But... Hardy Weinberg, so if we go back to those requirements, it's asking for a lot. It's asking that mutations don't happen. And we know mutations happen spontaneous or induced. How do you stop a mutation from happening? We know they're saying no migration, but we know that in the natural order of things, people and other animals are constantly moving and interacting with other people. And we definitely know that there's no random mating under most circumstances. At least in humans, we pick people based on certain traits. Animals, they also pick based on certain traits. That's why animals go through the extent they do to try to get their mates. So there's definitely some selection there. So only very certain genes in large populations with little migration and negligible natural selection can we use this formula for. And then there are other variations where we can expand it for three or more genes, and we can pair it with the chi-squared test to detect evolutionary change. However, if it doesn't, if the chi-square test shows that these things is not in equilibrium, it's said to be in disequilibrium, what does that mean? It means we have deviated from the Hardy-Weinberg equation. That means evolutionary change is happening. So if Hardy-Weinberg disequilibrium equals evolutionary change, which means natural selection is occurring, genetic drift is occurring, migration is occurring, and non-random mating is occurring, and that is usually what you get in a population, okay? So Hardy-Weinberg is nice, and it helps us to put a quantitative value on some, some alleles and genotypes, but it's not necessarily that predictive because we know that evolution is happening, and we know that these things are constantly occurring, okay? So any questions, comments, or concerns? Come to class. Let's talk about it. Let's try to work through some Hardy-Weinberg problems.